Well, greetings. Welcome to The Dividing Line. It is Friday, January 3rd, I believe. Uh, somewhere around there. Yep, that's what it says. Friday, January 3rd. We're doing things differently today. Um, just technical stuff, and who knows when we'll get back to doing it the normal way, but doing the best we can. And got a lot to get to today. Uh, let me just start off. I do need to mention, I mentioned this on uh, the blog and on Facebook and on Twitter, which are sort of our three ways of communicating with people. The blog, however, by the way, might want to keep that in your URLs uh, for when the other two means of communication go bye-bye, uh, because my assumption is that will be the last thing that anyone can get to uh, is, um, is our blog. So uh, keep that aomin.org uh, active, and I'm trying to write more there and then just cross post on, on other forums. But anyway, some exciting news uh, about the upcoming cruise. I realize that late September sounds like it's a long, long time from now, but it's really not. Um, it's coming up very quickly. And really, we only have to the end of this month. Uh, as far as um, at that point in time, we have to start giving cabins back and, and the ability to come along diminishes. Once in a lifetime trip, I know that's an overused phrase, um, but it will be. And uh, one of the things we're going to be doing, and I, this may be more for our European friends, to be honest with you, um, because I, I just a lot of people just can't get as long a period of time off as we're going to be over there, but uh, by doing this, but there's going to be two pre-cruise days in Rome, because we leave out of Rome. And so the two days before we leave, and a lot of people have already you know, started making travel plans, things like that, and hence you just can't, can't do this, but friends in Europe might be able to. Um, and if you have the freedom to do so, it's great. But we are going to be doing some special um, stuff there in Rome. We could be going to the Vatican. Um, you know, I've been there once before, and it's really good to be able to see. It is really good to be able to have a context for some of the things that we say, some of the things you see very often. Um, there's all sorts of other things to see uh, there in Rome that are very historically relevant and important. And you, you just, you know, I, I recently did uh, a series, uh, sermon series on the Lord's Supper. And the fact of the matter is, if you want to understand Protestant confessional language in regards to the Supper, you've got to understand the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Mass that lays behind it in denying it. Um, that's the language that was used. And so it's it's a part of church history. It's vitally important. That's going to be fantastic. The next day, we get to see places like the Colosseum. And that was, of all the things I saw in Rome, that was my favorite thing to see. Um when you think of how many of our brothers and sisters spilled their blood in that, uh, in the sand of that place, um, and to see what the Romans could do, and that the Romans aren't there anymore. Um, uh, there's, there's, a, there's wisdom to be found in seeing the ruins of once mighty societies, and uh, to recognize that, that time passes, and... Um, that society has passed away as well. Uh, so we'll be seeing the, the Colosseum the second day, as well as other things. So just really cool stuff going to the beginning. And then looking at um, Ephesus and Athens and having time to visit, I guess, I've not been to Ephesus, I guess the ruins there are just the best that you're going to see anywhere. And, and then, of course, uh, I got really, really excited uh, when I found out uh, that other than getting to to see Capernaum, and I specifically asked that we see Migdal, uh, Mary Magdalene. Migdal would be her home, uh, her home village. Uh, they, within the past number of years, found the first century synagogue in Migdal. And what that means is Jesus went about in all their synagogues teaching. And so Migdal was smacked out in the middle of it. This is the first century. The Capernaum synagogue is probably a third century synagogue. Don't have the first century. So if you want 
to stand next to stones that heard the Son of God teach. Migdal is the place to go. And um, I'm just really thinking about some special teaching to be able to do um, there in Migdal. I posted one of the pictures that I took in Migdal um, on uh, on the blog yesterday, so take a look at that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but like I said, Capernaum, uh, Migdal, uh, Jerusalem, obviously, the old city, Garden of Gethsemane, the wall, uh, all the things that you, you need to see to have the context. And just I'm just telling you ahead of time, I'm just telling you ahead of time, you stand at the gate the Garden of Gethsemane, and you look up toward where the temple was, and it's three rock throws, really good rock throws, but it's that close. And it, it just, for me... The, the thing I took away from visiting Israel um, in 2018 was just how small Israel is. It just that small. And you can you can walk around it. And that that was that that's how Jesus did things. But we're also gonna see Masada. And that means I'm bringing the DVDs of the Masada miniseries. Because <laughs> we've got we've got um, four days at sea. Um, and so it's two days over. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm sure there's a DVD player someplace on this ship. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking we need to watch the Masada miniseries, um, on the way over. Um, so that when we get there and I haven't told Mike about this yet, cause we've got to, we've got to figure out how this works, but those of you who want to do this with me, you just got to be ready. Because it only takes a few minutes to ride the cable car up to the top. But then there's the snake path. And I have unfinished business with the snake path. Uh, I did it last time I was there. I did it in, I think, just over 30 minutes. Um, it, um, if you've, have you ever climbed um, uh, Squaw Peak? Uh, no. Once, okay. It's sort of tough. Yeah. Okay. Snake path is not that difficult. It's almost the exact same climb, exact same distance, but it's very even. And once you get to the top, it's all nicely made steps. Unlike, I, I climbing Squaw Peak is much tougher than than the snake path, but it is not easy. And only those who can pretty much guarantee you can do it in less than thirty five minutes um, should even should even think about it. Um, Ask Emilio Ramos. <laughs> Ask Emilio how tough the snake path is. It is, um, it, it's, it's a challenge. But um, Masada is incredible, absolutely astonishing, especially if you get to watch the video beforehand so you know uh, what in the world happened there. And um, uh, yeah, so great stuff, great stuff. Uh, but the link is on our website. Um, now's the time to act. You know, between now and the end of the month is, and after that, things are going to get more difficult. Um, uh, you're going to have wait lists and, and things like that. So uh, I'm excited about it. I'm already thinking about really special teaching elements to, to tie in with these types of things. Um, and it's, it's going to be exciting. I don't think Jeff is thinking about any of that stuff right now because he's not sleeping. Um, he has a newborn in the home. Uh, who evidently likes to party at 1 a.m. So um, th there, there you go. Uh, that's that's how that works. Um, so uh, that's what's coming up. What are you doing? Uh, you're going to look at something real quick. Uh huh. I'll pay no attention. It's just, this is really, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, everything's. Everything. Yeah, I'm supposed to just ignore the man walking into the studio and walking around the cameras and stuff like that. It's great. All right. I need to jump on this quickly. A couple things. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and maximize this. Um, <sighs> Jamar Tisby, uh, 1231 19, 849 AM, Twitter. Just in case you didn't know, it's James Cone's blackness more than his theology that some people are sorry to condemn and call heresy. I would imagine that this was prompted by. Um, the very strange uh, tweets from uh, Dr. A Danny Aiken of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, who starts off with a tweet about 
I'm really concerned about James Cone's beliefs, but if, if he ends up in heaven, then we're just going to uh, we're just going to celebrate Jesus together. And then what, a couple hours later, but I think he was a heretic. Um, there was no reason for the first one, none whatsoever. And that's what prompted the second one. And I, I'm, I just, I, I don't get it. But in any case, um, I am not going to spend time today requoting the hours and hours of James Cone's writings that ha we have already provided on this program. It, it literally is hours. We are not. We we have not taken one little quote here and one little quote there. We have read pages and pages and pages from multiple books, and books that were published, uh, and continued to be published, and that he was promoting right at the end of his life. Remember, this man taught at Union Theological Seminary. Union Theological Seminary is not a Christian seminary. It is. It is a. It is the. I, I call it the Walker Seminary. It, it's the Walking Dead. Um, it, it died uh, 120 years plus ago, and it's still walking around, pretending to be a seminary. But it's 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 dead. It's been it's dead, Jim, for a long time. And he was a professor there because he fit in there, because anything fits in there except for the Christian faith. That is, anyone who actually believes the Bible doesn't doesn't fit in there. Um. James Cone said that if you're a white man and you want to be reconciled to God, you've got to do it through black people. I mean, the, the, there is... The, Joseph Smith was, was as orthodox as James Cone. Okay, I mean, it's just, just ridiculously out there, and there is no defense of it. I, I recognize that people will try to spin things, contextualize things. The very same people who will want... Jonathan Edwards thrown out of the Christian faith will put just as much effort into spinning James Cone to try to keep him in the Christian faith, but there just isn't any way to do it. All I have to do is just go read his books. That's all you've got to do. The man is, is encouraging violence, telling blacks to nurture the animosity that's within them. If you want the most divisive racist theology that's ever been provided to mankind, it's James Cone. That's a, that's a fact. That's, that is not even debatable. I mean, if I were to debate this, all you got to do is just sit there. Okay, I got another 20 minutes. Okay, beginning on page and just, and, 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 and there's, there's no way around it. That's just, that's just the fact. So, for Jamar Tisby to come out and say it's James Cone's blackness more than his theology that some people are so ready to condemn and call heresy is just absurd. This is race baiting on, on steroids. It's let's divide, 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 divide when there is no reason to. I mean, there is not... <sighs> Jamar, just repent of it. It, you're just you're wrong. You know you're wrong. You know what you're doing. This was purposeful. You know you did it at the time you did it for the reasons you did it. You know all about it. Um, it's just it's it's horrible. So uh, there's there's that. Um, that is that is that is sad. Um, okay, I was sent <clears throat> this, and I uh, apologize to Mr. Israel Anderson for our technical problems yesterday. Because I had contacted him by Facebook and said we're going to review it, and then we weren't able to do the program. I was sent this. It's not really long. People will sometimes say, man, there is just so much false teaching in the world today in comparison to times past. Well, think about it. There's, um, there's twice as many people on the planet today than there was only a few decades ago. Um, so you've got that combined Combined with technology, combined with not only the printing press, but today the internet. So anybody with a modem and a keyboard can put anything out there. And so not very long ago, you just wouldn't have heard of a lot of this stuff. There just wasn't any means for it to be communicated. Uh, now there's a means for it to be communicated, and a lot of people just live their lives on the internet. It's a sad, it's a sad thing, um, but it's it's true. So a fellow up from Boulder, Colorado, who I, I looked at the website, very directly says he's a former Christian, former Christian minister of some type. 
is no longer a Christian, so is technically an apostate, is into strange Akkadian inscription stuff, just some way, 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 way out there stuff. But I wasn't able to comment on this on, on Facebook, but this kind of thing you run into, and our response can't just be to go, well, that's weird. That's how a lot of Christians respond, and well, that's weird. Um, yeah, it's weird, but that does not amount to a response. So let me just run through this real quick, give you an idea of some of the stuff you're into out there, and then give a response to it. One of the hardest things to accept that came as a result of the discoveries I've made, so he's claiming to have discovered all this stuff, is the identity of Yahweh, the evil, sadistic God of most of the Old Testament, is not the Father of Jesus. Now, immediately, immediately, those of you who are at all familiar with church history go, ah, Marcion rides again, because Marcion, the second century Gnostic heretic, was... I, I mean, if you if you were a Christian for 200 years, you and you wanted to be known for doing something, you wrote a book against Marcion. Everybody wrote a book against Marcion. And Marcion said that Yahweh was not the father of Jesus. That was a separate God. He 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 introduced this distinction where, you know, he comes up with a, a modified New Testament that takes out all the references to the Old Testament and the Jewish people and so on and so forth and and tries to create this distinction saying, no, the God of the Old Testament is not the Father of Jesus. So there, you immediately hear that, and I don't, I'm not saying that there is a direct connection to Gnosticism, but it is a common misunderstanding on the part of many people. I, many people sitting in Baptist churches. I, I, I remember very clearly in a Southern Baptist church, being in a small group where, where someone had said, well, you know, Jesus comes and, and he makes the mean God of the Old Testament like us. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, whoa, no, 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 no. You, you missed everything. Uh, you've, you've fully missed the entire message of the New Testament. Um, but it's, it takes lots of different forms, and it's, it's out there. So, the evil, sadistic God of most of the Old Testament is not the Father of Jesus. Jesus actually says this three times in John 8 alone, but we skip over those parts because we didn't understand how, why Jesus would be saying that to his own people. Jesus, of course, didn't say anything like that, but we'll look at that briefly. But we've since found many Christian teachers that had also worked this out without any connection to the other things I have found. Got to have something other. Finding blogs online that go into far more detail and evidence of this than I had found yet was something of a relief. Without any doubt, coming to the acceptance of this was the most challenging part of all this so far. One of my favorite worship songs is Yahweh by Vineyard Music. It's been gut-wrenching to look at the growing evidence that Yahweh is not the father of Jesus, but he's the very person that tempted Jesus in the desert. And the very same person Jesus calls the father of all lies and a murderer from the beginning in John 8. Even as you read this, you can't accept this idea, and I totally get that. It took me two years to finally accept it myself. You probably want to defriend me right now, but hold on. Here's something to help you. One, in the entirety of the Bible, not a single text exists that claims Yahweh is the father of Jesus. Now, I mean, this, the level of ignorance of the New Testament here is overwhelming, but people like this are writing two people on the internet who have zero knowledge of the New Testament. They don't know anything about intertextuality, the relationship of the Old Testament, New Testament, the relationship of the New Testament writers utiliz utilizing the Greek Septuagint translation of the, of the Old Testament and quoting it all the time, the New Testament. They don't know the stuff that we talk about on this program fairly regularly. And one of the things I want to do in 2020, and we'll be getting to later in the program, is we, we need to make sure our foundations are strong. Uh, you know, just because I was thinking about, and I'll mention this later, but we have talked about foundational stuff for so many decades that sometimes, like, I, I want to go back over a series that I did, and I start thinking about, well, that was 17 years ago. And the vast majority of people watching this program, they were not watching 17 years ago. Now, now some of you are weird enough to go back and listen to stuff 17 years ago, but you're the minority. The majority of folks are just picking stuff up as we make reference to them. 
And so um, it is vitally important for us. And here's the danger. There's so much going on in the world. Wars and rumors of wars right now, quite honestly, um, to use language from a different time period and a different application. But there's so much going on politically, culturally, things like that, that the danger is that we won't build the foundations we need to build to be able to respond to everything that's happening around us. We need to have foundations within ourselves, within the faith itself. But the temptation is to be so focused on upon stuff over here that we don't have these foundations firm. And that's what we need to have. Uh, we need to be putting out that effort. Um, so, um, in the entirety of the Bible, not a single text exists that claims Yahweh is the father of Jesus. That, that of course, is absurd. Uh, where does the idea come from? You know where. The same place all this nonsense always comes from. Roman universalism. What? Uh, the early church fathers were teaching this stuff long before anybody in... Long, there were, this was the belief of early Christians when there were still a multiplicity of elders in Rome, before the monarchical episcopate had even developed. Um, so, two, Jesus' own words ought to be sufficient in John 8. Devour that chapter. Go deep into it. Yeah, when you do, that'll be the end of this. Look up the words. Jesus is extremely plain about who the Jews are following, really is. He says plainly, your father is not my father. He actually calls Yahweh the devil. No, he does not. Obviously, he says, the father testifies of me. You claim to follow him, but you do not know him. It is the false claim they do not know who he is. They are not following in his way. But there is no way on God's green earth you can read John chapter 8 and come up with the idea that he is identifying Yahweh as Satan. That is just absurd on a level that's difficult to even begin to comprehend. Number three, imagine never having to be embarrassed. Now, here's, here's the real reason. Imagine never having to be embarrassed about Yahweh's treatment of humans ever again. Because new context has shown who he really is. New context. I wonder what that is. Uh, you know, some revelatory stuff that they're claiming from some Akkadian source or something. Uh, no more atheists throwing this in your face and you having to come up with rather illogical arguments to excuse the difference in behavior between Yahweh and Jesus. So again, this is, this is unhitching from the Old Testament on steroids, okay? This is full-blown Gnosticism in its, in its, in its desire uh, to come up with something new. So is Yahweh actually the Christian Satan? Although that will sound extremely offensive to you right now, consider it for a moment. If you're able, think back over the entire story. Why did Jesus come in the first place? Why is Jesus needing to fulfill, complete the law if it was his father's law? Remember, Jesus only does what he sees the father doing, yet Jesus has never acted anything remotely like Yahweh. Now you know why. So how did Yahweh become the father of the Jews? He stole them. He stole them from Egypt and forced them to worship him or die. I'm just reading it to you. The Jews are not at fault. They are not to be blamed. This is the veil that must be lifted off the Jews and the Christians. Everyone's always got a hook. Everyone's always got, this is how, you know, if, if you follow me, here's my new thing. It is important, especially in today's volatile society with anti-Semitism on the rise, that no blame of any kind is apportioned to the Jews, who are without any doubt Jesus' own people, as Jesus himself declared, I came to my own, and they did not recognize me. Once, that's not what he specifically said, that was John, 1, 4, John chapter 1, but anyways, once you resolve this, many, many things are going to make sense. Yeah, you need that Gnostic knowledge. I expect this will be harder for you to accept than it was even for me, though. It might take you many years even. This is a very, very difficult thing to come to grips with. It's not going to be easy. Jesus didn't come to free us from his father, but from Satan, Yahweh. Yahweh kills, Jesus saves. End of story. Okay, full-blown heresy. We, we recognize that. But anyone seeing that, you, you just automatically know, okay, this is way out there. How would you respond to it? Well, if you have a sound understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity, then you know the New Testament writers identify the Father as Yahweh, who is the one who lays our sins upon the Messiah in Isaiah 53. Yahweh. Yahweh lays our sins upon the Messiah. Jesus is identified as Yahweh. Jesus is identified as Yahweh in John chapter 8. Twice, John 8, 24 and 8, 58, Jesus used the phrase ego aimi, which is used as a, another name for Yahweh in the Old Testament. He is the I am. 
This is the identification of Jesus in that fat. That's why the Jews pick up stones to stone him in John 8, 858, because he says, Prin Abraham Genesai, ego I me, before Abraham was, I am. And so the son is identified as Yahweh, not only here in, here in John 8, but in especially, specifically as Yahweh in John chapter 12, where quoting from Isaiah 6, where Isaiah sees Yahweh sitting upon his throne, lofty and lifted up, sees his glory. John quotes that and then says, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke about him. Isaiah, who did you see? I saw Yahweh. John, who did Isaiah see? He saw Jesus. So John identifies Jesus as Yahweh. The Spirit is the Spirit of Yahweh. You have the one name used of three divine persons. If you understand Trinitarian theology, it's very obvious that this gentleman never did. Um, you can see where the error is immediately. He's assuming some type of Unitarian concept. A lot of people do. Uh, that's where you actually need to go a whole lot deeper uh, into the text than this fellow has. And so um, when, you, when you read John chapter 8, what you actually discover is the, the chapter beginning in verse 12, because remember 753, 811, woman taking adultery is a major textual variant. It's not original John, but when you read it, you see there is a first portion then there is the story of the people who believe, having heard the words. And then when Jesus says, if you continue my words, you're my disciples indeed, no truth, truth set, set you free. And as soon as Jesus says, truth set you free, this is, offends them. Uh, we've never been enslaved to anyone. And by the end of the chapter, those false disciples are picking up stones to stone him. And it is in that discussion then that you have Jesus talking about the witness of his father. Now, the only person the Jews would have understood his father to be was Yahweh. No question about it. So when he says, Prin Abraham genestai ego I me, before Abraham was, I am. When he says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, rejoiced and, and was glad, probably referring to what happened in Genesis 18 and 19. When Yahweh walks with the two angels by the oaks of Mamre, meets with Abram. And when the two angels go down to Sodom and Gomorrah, and then they bring Lot out, and then Yahweh on earth rains fire and brimstone from Yahweh in heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah. So the Yahweh on earth who has been seen is Jesus. The pre-incarnate the son, obviously not incarnate yet, if you want to use a different term because of that, because his name is given to him at the incarnation, that's fine. But the point is, you have this incredible Yahweh on earth rains fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah from Yahweh in heaven. You have a plurality seen right there. It's very important. Is that the background to when Jesus says, Abram saw my day and rejoiced and was glad? If so, you've got another, another further identification of Jesus as Yahweh. There is no way to read John chapter 8 in any contextual fashion that starts with John 1 and goes to John 20 and then allows John to be a part of the New Testament where you can come up with this idea that Yahweh is some evil God. Not only that, but if we're correct in the connection to Genesis 19, and Abram seeing Jesus' day, then it was Jesus that brought fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah, which I would imagine is probably what people are thinking about, that, that evil God, Yahweh. That evil, there is no evil God, Yahweh. There is a holy God, Yahweh, that brings judgment upon evil people, upon pagan religions and that had child sacrifice and, and everything else. Uh, God does bring judgment. But you see, most of these people don't believe in a God who has wrath, which means there's a whole bunch of sections of the New Testament they're not really going to like either. Uh, because, you, you know, and you know, like Jesus talking about, you know, bring, me, bring these men before me and destroy them and stuff like that. Yeah, they, we don't, they don't want to talk about that part either, uh, because they're editing God down to fit their, their own perspective. But again, having a positive understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity will help you to understand where these people have gone wrong, where they've, uh, where they've missed things, and uh, that will be very, very helpful. 
I'm not answering things. I've got a timer going to to know where we are time wise in uh, in the program, and that's why I needed to take a look at it. All right, so there's um, there's that. You will find uh, everything. There's Israel Anderson. Um, Yahweh kills. Jesus saves. No, Jesus is Yahweh, and Yahweh uh, brings judgment and justice and righteousness and power and grace and mercy, and we just try to edit him down uh, to fit into the things that, uh, that we want to fit him into. All right. Um, I don't really have to, I'll, I'll get to that one later on. I'll, I'll, I'll fill that one in uh, a little bit later on. Um, talking about foundational issues. I don't remember how many, you know, when I sit in this room, sometimes I think about when we did a, a series last, and I remember we did a series on Sola Scriptura, which I would think was fairly recently, um, but when I think it's fairly recent, that's probably within the past 10 years. And again, when I'm when I'm meeting people, so often they'll say, I've been listening for two years, for three years, maybe five years, but it's rare to find people who've been listening for 10 years. Um, and so it is important to be able to revisit key issues. We we mention them, we talk about them. We talk about solo scriptura. It's sort of given as a uh, as a starting point. But one thing that I'm observing, there are a lot of people who have adopted the reformed label for themselves. But in reality, they don't have a deep foundation in the necessary truths that give rise to Reformed theology. If you, if you came to Reformed theology from the standard perspective that basically you're getting to sit back and decide for yourself. I'm just going to decide for myself um, what beliefs I'm going to embrace, and and I'm going to try a little bit of this, I'm going to try a little bit of that. Well, you know, this reform stuff, this is really cool right now. The, the cool kids are reformed. And so I'm going to, I'm going to go that direction. I'm, that's a very dangerous a very dangerous path. I, I don't believe anyone who comes that direction will remain reformed their entire life. I just don't. Um, there is a necessary point in time for someone who is reformed, whether you're raised that way, come into the reformed faith, from some type of synergistic system, there comes a point in time where you have to simply face the reality of who God is and who you are, and that you are not God, and that God has the right to do with you as He pleases. You, you can't escape it. You, you deal with the self-shattering reality of who and what you really are. That you're a creature, you're like the, the, the grass, the, the flower that blooms in the morning and fades by the evening. You are in existence for a very brief period of time. You know little. Very, very little. And you are dependent for every breath you take, every beat of your heart, upon someone else. And it changes you. And one of the reasons that I really, when I, when I speak to apostates, 
who claim to have once been with us and they've now embraced some type of system where they're they're adding to the work of Christ, to their sacramental activities and so on and so forth. I'm just like you you just never you just never were there, were you? Because when I push them on that, you know, t- talk to me about how you once fully trusted in the imputed righteousness of Christ. You looked to your substitute. You you saw the perfection of his work in your behalf. And what was it that convinced you that that's not enough? They 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 have no answers for that. They really have no answers for that. So um, I'm seeing people who claim once to have been reformed. And, you know, they had been something else for a while, and then they were something else for a while, and now they've been reformed. And I just go, yeah, well, we'll see where you are in five years or 10 years. Because if you're really reformed, you'll still be there. And if you're, if you get bored, if the, when the newness wears off, there's always a honeymoon period for anyone who converts in. There's always a honeymoon period. You know, people become Roman Catholics and Rome can do no wrong. And then, you know, a few years down the road, you've had to live with these folks for a while. And it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, then you start really seriously dealing with the politics and all the rest of the stuff in Rome. And, and so you know, a lot of people, what happens is they, when the newness wears off and being reformed, they want something more. And so they think that they can get that with some kind of higher ecclesiology. Uh, you know, let's, let's get some liturgy going. Now, if they came from a liturgical background, this really isn't an option for them because they were looking for something more. They've already recognized that you can only do the ceremonies so many times before the newness wears off there too. And so it's normally people who've come from a non-liturgical background, they become reformed and then they move into wanting something more. And so the, it's the, it's the smells and bells that starts getting, getting to them. And so they might go, you know, some of them used to go, you know, into some of the higher churches, maybe Anglican or something like that. Um, and then a real common route is uh, Protestant, Anglican, Eastern Orthodox, Rome. But nowadays I'm seeing people that are doing the Rome Eastern Orthodoxy thing. That's normally, it's not really normal way, but it, but it happens. And I think Francis has something to do with that, especially right now. I mean, when, you, when you've got two living popes that are that far apart on matters of faith and morals, uh, yeah, okay. Of course, there is a Western form of orthodoxy, and then there's the real orthodoxy in the East. And not many of the converts here in the United States really embrace the Eastern way because it involves a completely different way of thought, completely different way of thought. Um, and it, it's, it's difficult to really get into that while in a Western culture, unless you're raised with it. So I'm seeing guys who claim to have been reformed and they'll go off to some of these different, different perspectives. And then you'll listen to them. Now, now folks, I've been doing this a few years now. Um, and one of the least pleasing, satisfying, enjoyable aspects of doing what I do is the fact that I have to spend a lot of time listening to apostates. 
listening to people who've left the faith. Some of you know there was a rather well-known apostate, what was that, seven, eight, nine years ago now? Presbyterian minister met right in my office right over here. We talked. Um, he ended up going way off into who knows what eventually. Um, but, I mean, just total life collapse. Uh, sad thing to sad thing to observe. But I've I've talked to a lot of these folks, and I I have a lot of experience in dealing with people who claim to have once I was once where you are. That's uh, you know the atheists who do it, and the Muslims who do it, and um, the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox and the Mormons and whatever. Um, that is a, that's considered to be the Trump card. And that Trump card meant something before 2016, by the way, uh, had a different meaning back then. Um, that's, that's considered that that's supposed to have real gravitas. It has real, ooh, you know, and, um, so I've got a lot of experience on this and I can tell you that there, there is a honeymoon stage where the group that you've joined can do nothing wrong. And the group you left can do nothing right. That eventually breaks down. Time deals with it. Um, and yes, I have met many a person who left and then came back and you know was apologetic and came back for the right reasons and and yes, I have seen that type of thing happen as well. But then you, you also see the people who just, they move from one religious belief to another religious belief because they don't have the root of the matter in them. They're, they're, the, they're the shallow soil seed. And Jesus warned about them. And there's nothing you can do about them. That's, that's who they are. That's, that's the way it is. Now, um, a number of years ago, uh, in 2009, in fact, the first reference I found on our blog was 2004, to fall by the name of Jay Dyer. And Jay Dyer was one of these former Reformed guys, um, studied at Bonson Theological Seminary, and then... My understanding is went to Rome and then eventually Eastern Orthodoxy. And so there was one reference in 2004, I think. And then in 2009, Turretin Fan wrote a 13 part series responding to Jay Dyer on Calvinism. He had posted something, I don't remember if it's a video or an article uh, on the subject of Calvinism. And Turretin Fan did a 13-part thorough response um, to him uh, that, I would, that I would recommend to you if you want to um, do some reading rather than just listening. Well, um, on, I think, the 29th of December, Jay Dyer posted um, a video about reasons why he is not a Protestant. And it started making some rounds in Facebook. And let me, I'm going, to, I'm old enough to talk like this to those of you who are younger than I am. I'm not super old, but I've been doing this for a while. If, if you can watch this video and not immediately identify Fundamental foundational errors of misrepresentation, foundational misunderstandings of Reformed theology, then you've got some homework you need to be doing. And if something like this really throws you for a loop, you're not well grounded. You're, you're just not. You, you may think that you're out there, you know, swinging your sword, but sorry, uh, there are foundational issues 
in why you are to believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. That if you can't see through what Jay Dyer says at the beginning of this video, uh, well, we're gonna, that's why we're going to be dealing with it. Same thing with issues of justification. And let's just be honest. One of the differences, in my opinion, between the old Reformed and the new Reformed, I'm not using young, restless, ref I've, I never hate, I, that, that, that was horrible phraseology from the start. Um, but one of the differences, see, I, I became Reformed when it wasn't popular to be Reformed, when it wasn't a movement it was, you were, you, you were having to make a decision that was probably going to cost you. And it did cost us. Man, it cost us. Um, today you can become reformed and it's, you know, it's considered to be cool and, and hipster and stuff like that. And, and the, one of the differences between back then and now is back then, one of the fundamental things that you were driven to immediately was you got some level of knowledge of church history into you, and not just Luther and Calvin and the Reformation. That's important, but the fact of the matter is, if you read this, Calvin's Institutes, Okay, if, you know, pretty, pretty nicely marked up set here, and I did that back in seminary. And so, if you read the Institutes of the Christian Religion, you are going to get hit constantly. Now, I don't think I have my full size. This is a somewhat edited down version. I, I didn't include all of the. I must have it in in the office uh, somewhere. I'll have to I'll have to look for it. I've got a really nicely done leather bound full institute. So it's you may be going. That's not big enough. Yeah, it, it'd be about a much bigger. If you read this, and not just to try to get through it, but to try to understand it, you're going to be hit by patristic citations, right, left, and center. You're going to be reading about Augustine and Chrysostom and Tertullian and because the reformers took very seriously their claim to Catholicity. They took very seriously. They, they, they rejected the idea that what they were doing was starting a whole new, whole new movement, a whole new church. They believed very much in ad fontes, back to the sources. And they made strong arguments. Um, I wonder. No, I probably got that. Uh, you know, some of the some of the first books that I grabbed hold of because I was it's around the same time I started dealing with Roman Catholicism. So I really saw the richness of this and the importance of knowing the the connections to church history. Some of the best works that have demonstrated the aberrations and errors of Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy um, came from the Reformers because they really knew the early Church Fathers. They did not, as Rome tries to do, and Eastern Orthodoxy to a lesser extent, try to turn the early Church Fathers into mirror images of themselves. Um... You can't do that. The early church fathers were the early church fathers. They were a very diverse group in many ways. There were certain things that absolutely held them together, and there were things that they did not share in common as well. You have to let the early church fathers be the early church writers. That's, that's historiographically necessary, and it's just simply the only honest way to deal with them. But they took them very seriously. And so that was a part of my formation was to see these types of things. Now, there is a book. I do not think it's in here. No, no, yes, it is. I don't know what it... I don't think I have the current version of this. 
Yeah, I don't have the current version of this. Uh, maybe I do in the other room. This is what it looked like originally. Saw the scripture, the proposition on the Bible. Uh, Michael Horton, Robert Godfrey, myself, R.C. Sproul, John Armstrong, John MacArthur, Sinclair Ferguson, Joel Beakey, Ray Lanning, Don Kessler was the general editor. Um, I wrote a rather extensive chapter in here. Um, it was right before R.C.'s The Establishment of Scripture. Uh, so mine extends from page 27 to page 62. Um, and you will find it filled with numerous references to Athanasius, lots and lots of Greek, so on and so forth, because it was important to establish these things. Um, that element seems to be missing from a lot of the new Calvinism that historical connection, that almost holistic element to it, where you've not only got the theology, but you've, you've, got, you've got the history, not just back through the Puritans, but back beyond the Reformation, and, and a meaningful, fair understanding of what happened in the medieval period. Um, what was happening in the early church? Uh, why do you see um, the departures from apostolic teaching among certain early church writers? Um, make sure, uh, by the way, and I, I mentioned this to a dear brother just a couple days ago, here's the um, uh, three-volume Holy Scripture set. Uh, make sure you've got material like that as well um, available to you. It's very, very important. Be, I've seen, when I see what we're going to watch here, we will be able to watch it, right? Hope so. Rich says hope so. If not, you'll be able to hear it, and I'll try not to do silly things uh, while it's on, just in case we end up... If, if we have a technical issue, because we're having technical issues, so we're recording this completely differently than normal. If what you see is me still sitting here while you're listening to this, don't worry about it. It's just because we had issues putting all the video feeds together. But I want to listen to what Jay Dyer says at the beginning of this video. We may do more of it in the future. It's worthwhile on justification, things like that. Um, the, only, the only hesitation I have, I'll be honest with you, the only hesitation I have, I have said for a very, very long time that I... I do not have the time to get into the level of criticism of Eastern Orthodoxy that someone needs to get into. There have been a few books published. They're not easily accessible. They're not written in such a way. And, and it may just be because of the subject, because I, I don't even know how I would do it. The reason, you know, some, some people will remember that when Hank Hanegraaff converted, I made some comments on the subject of orthodoxy. And if you recall, what I basically said was that this subject is next to impossible to address because if you actually understand the orthodox mindset, it is not a Western way of thinking. And we're all Western thinkers. We almost all of the ap apologetic discussion that we have on this program is deeply entrenched in Western ways of thought. Eastern ways of thought are not as wedded to a clear commitment to what we would call logical categories. There is a level of experientialism and mysticism in Eastern thought that is only present in certain medieval writers, spiritualists, um, devotionalists. I mean, there, there is an element of it. Um, there's always been the interface between the two, because it's not like 
you know, you could divide, no one built a wall uh, somewhere around Greece to, to keep all that type of stuff out. Um, but Western thinking, the reason that we can engage Roman Catholicism on dogmatic statements of belief, and here's this catechism, and this says this, and here's this systematic theology, is because Roman Catholicism is Western thinking, Protestantism is Western thinking, Eastern Orthodoxy just really doesn't have anything like that. In Eastern, real Eastern Orthodoxy, as it's practiced in Russia, Ukraine, you've got the Greek Orthodox as well, but there's been more cross-pollination there, I think, um, because they're the ones that have to have the most, have had historically the most interaction with the West and most influence on, upon it. Um, the liturgy and the prayers of the church are the statement of systematic theology. So it's hard for those of us in the West to understand Energia, the energies, and how energies can be spatially located, but only spiritually located, but access through the liturgy and worship of the church and trying to get Westerners to have any type of meaningful standpoint from which to even read Eastern Orthodox writing, to begin to understand it, to then to be able to bring it to the standard of Scripture, and even to have a meaningful discussion as to the m proper means of exegesis of Scripture. Massively complicated. Massively complicated. Um, and I know that to do it truly well would be a massive undertaking of time that I hope the Lord lays upon someone's heart that has the background to do it. There are, like I said, there have been a couple books written. There's some, I think there's you know, some book on books on um, the orthodoxy and the doctrine of the Trinity that are really useful and, and things like that. But I just haven't seen a lot that's, I can just go, yeah, that, that big book right there will do what you need. I, I just don't, haven't seen that yet. And it needs to be there. Uh, there there's, a, there's a need. That, you know, I could sit here and say, hey, if, you know, you're a seminary student and, you know, daddy left you a fair amount of money so you can study anything, there's some, some good topics that, that really need um, some special attention, I think. Uh, and some of that just may be my own ignorance. There, maybe there is something out there and someone will tell me about it and I'll go, yay, thank you. Um, because I don't know everything and am dependent upon people pointing me to stuff very often to go, oh, that's that's interesting, that's cool. Anyway, so you can see that there is a, um, unlike many people who just, assume that orthodoxy is popeless Catholicism, and therefore it's just all just all wrong, and it's all bad, same, same reasons that, that Rome is. Uh, when I addressed the issue of Hanegraaff's conversion, I tried to do so with some care, um, because I think that's, that's important to do, just simply because I don't want to be one of those people that claims to know everything from afar. Um, I, I think those who make those kind of claims will be judged by God someday, and it will be a harsh judgment. Anyway, with all of that said, at the same time, my personal conclusion is that orthodoxy, as it becomes a cultural experience, which it does in Ukraine and Russia, a place like that, dies. It becomes folk religion. Um, the important, vital, I mean, the weird, the weird thing about orthodoxy is you end up with divine truths established in a culture that don't end up changing hearts. So orthodoxy is inveterately Trinitarian. And, and in fact, most orthodox people 
understand the doctrine of the Trinity far better than most Protestants do. Because it's all around them all the time. But it once at once at, at any point in time when the Christian faith in any form becomes a cultural thing, it dies. Because the change of the heart is first and foremost. So once you are simply a Christian because you're born into it, we've seen what that results in. Whether it's in the West or the East, it's always a dead nominalism. And dead nominalism in Europe went off into wild liberalism that bears almost no semblance to Christianity at all. In Ukraine and Russia, it becomes folk religion where you go to these places of energy and it almost it starts reverting back to a form of paganism. Whenever the heart's taken out, that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. When the gospel and the gospel call of faith and repentance, dying to self, living to Christ alone, when that, when that is gone, the, the results become very ugly. So with that being said, um, what you have with someone like a Jay Dyer is a westernized orthodoxy that looks a lot like Rome, but not quite. Um, and when Orthodox folks try to do apologetics, they just, they can't avoid ending up sounding very much like they're just simply public Catholics because they end up having to try to translate Orthodox categories into Western language. And that's what Rome's been doing for a long time. So it ends up sounding very similar, even if there is an attempt to make some kind of a, of a difference. And by the way, one of the things, um, one of the common things, and this is this, I think the first, I think the first reference on our website to Jay Dyer was about this. Um, Orthodox will love to use early Christological terminology to criticize Protestants. They'll say that we're monothelites. They'll say that we're Nestorians. And one of the reasons that, you know, at, at least the folks at my church know what, what Nestorius was all about. Well, actually, what Nestorianism is, there's some fairly decent recent research that would say Nestorius wasn't actually a Nestorian, but poor guy. Anyway, be that as it may, um, I just recently, while doing the catechism instruction at Apologia, specifically went through the early Christological heresies and, and what they involved and the denial of the hypostatic union and stuff like that. The Orthodox love to use that kind of thing to make, I think, grossly inappropriate accusations against other people because it's effective, because they they know that the vast majority of the people they're talking to and even wouldn't even know why they should be offended by being called in a story in the first place. I think it's in, as I said, grossly inappropriate. It's not not proper, it's not it doesn't actually um, make any sense, but they do it, they do it rather frequently. Um, and I think one of the reasons they do it is it gives, it's like when Jehovah's Witnesses attack the shape of the cross or birthdays or holidays or something like that. It's a, it's a grab. It's a, it's something you can hook on to somebody um, because there are at least some Orthodox. Now this is very, very different in Ukraine, but there are at least, because I have much more experience in Ukraine than I do in Russia. I've only been to Russia once, but I've been to Ukraine many times. They are not into apologetics, evangelism, nothing like that. So it's like, no, 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 not even, no. Because, I mean, that was one of the first things I said. Hey, do you think we get a dialogue going? You know, no, 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 it's not, not going to happen. Um, so in the West, they are trying to be, to draw, you know, call somebody to orthodoxy. I've been going on way too long here. This, this is one of the problems doing it this way, um, is that, you know, uh, yeah, it's, you know, I'm just, you know. So let's take a look at um, what Jay Dyer says here. And so here's my challenge to you who are Reformed. Um, listen, understand, and if you don't automatically recognize where Jay Dyer is misrepresenting his former faith, maybe he, maybe he was ignorant, 
it's possible. There's certainly lots of reformed people who are. I, I th- th- you know, this stuff existed, was available when when he was still reformed. So, but the point is, you should be able to recognize it, and if not, then take it as a challenge to be able to to deal with this. So uh, let's let's take a look at what is said here. I don't know. I'll give you my top ten reasons as to why I am no longer Protestant. Haven't been a Protestant since two thousand two, three, and why I ultimately found it completely unconvincing. So there's there's not in, in any specific uh, ordering to these. It's not like this one is the clincher. They all kind of go together, and they were a process of. Things that I realized over time as a Protestant seminary student. Yes, I attended Bonson Seminary, the now defunct reformed institution after the leg- legacy and lineage of Bonson, which I guess went under. I don't know exactly what happened to it, but it doesn't exist anymore. But I did learn some things at Bonson Seminary. So for that, I- I'm-, I'm happy. I'm appreciative. But ultimately, we're going to talk about how that system doesn't work. So number one, what is the first thing that comes to mind? I would say the inadequacy and unbiblical nature of sola scriptura itself. The idea that the only rule of faith for Christians, for the church, that it's the text of scripture is itself a historical and unbiblical. Firstly, because... Okay, can can you tell... Um why we've done so many debates on this subject in the past. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I, he says there's no order, but this is almost always the first thing. And that's why it was the first debate we did against Jerry Mattatix. We did multiple times with Jerry Mattatix. We've done it with, with numerous other um, Roman Catholic apologists as well. Um, and it is central in... Uh, we have responded, by the way, over the years, there was um, there used to be an Eastern Orthodox radio program here in the Valley, and uh, I played comments that they made on Sola Scriptura. That was probably sometime around two thousand, early two thousands, probably some. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, but it will be fundamental approach, and so it's a historical. So that's why I said. You want the three-volume set there. You want William Whitaker's Dispensations on Holy Scripture. You want George Salmon's Infallibility of the Church. You want Chemnitz's work on the Council of Trent. Um, not exhaustive, but between those sources, you will have literally hundreds of pages of citations from the early Church Fathers um, that you won't find in the Jurgens set published, uh, promoted by Catholic Answers and, and people like that. Um, and that's why my chapter in Sola Scriptura focused upon key affirmations. But here's the question. Do you know Sola Scriptura well enough to represent misrepresentations of it? Because Sola Scriptura is not saying that Scripture is sufficient for all things. If you hear someone say that that's Sola Scriptura, then you should know that they are either ignorant or purposely misrepresenting things. One of the two. There are specific terms. It's like, this is, is a, when, when we define the doctrine of the Trinity and talk about three co-equal, co-eternal persons sharing the one being that is God, if we played fast and loose with the terms being and person, we'd end up with immediate heresy. If I said there are three persons in the one person that is God, you should immediately go, oh, but, 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 but what? And catch the error. Just as important, when we talk about sola scriptura, we are saying the scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. And that is intimately connected to the nature of scripture being God-breathed. What we're saying is there is only one God-breathed revelation that has been given to the church. That's what we're saying. And if you don't know that and, and are, don't see why that's central, then the misrepresentations, the straw men, will be piled up all around you, then it's lit and you're, you're toast.
was no canon of scripture in the early church. For many centuries— I stopped at a bad place. Very, very often what you have is canon and sufficiency mixed together. And obviously they're related, but they're two very different issues. And this again, just as Jehovah's Witnesses go for the Trinity, because they know that Christians don't know the Trinity very well, at least the ones they run into at the door, um, these folks go for sola scriptura and canon. Because again, when was the last time you heard a sermon on the canon of Scripture? You've probably heard sermons on the inspiration of Scripture, but sermons on the canon? Um, how many... How many Christian pastors do you know would be comfortable enunciating their reasons for not accepting the Apocrypha as Scripture? Not many. Because the vast majority of theological seminaries spend next to no time on discussion of the subject. Now, it's not that there aren't solid good reasons. I, one of the first debates I did, uh, 1993, Boston College, Jerry Mattatix, Apocrypha. One of the great debates, uh, Gary Machuda, Apocrypha. It's not that the information isn't there. It's just that even, even most of our supporters and fans, if you were looking at my list of debates... Where would those rank in your, oh, I want to get some popcorn and watch that one list? Not very high, let's be honest. And so they go for where they know the weakness is. Um, and it's, it's, an, it's an efficient and effective uh, approach. Sure, it actually took six, seven centuries before the church had a rough outline of what the canon would be. And even into the seventh century, one of the great... Eastern theologians, one of the first systematic theologian writers, St. John of Damascus, even his canon was different from the rest of the church. But most people don't reject St. John of Damascus. We certainly don't in the Orthodox Church. So if you look at the progression of the formation of the canon itself, you're led to the conclusion that if you're a Protestant, a fallible group of men put together an infallible canon. Okay. Um not going to be spending a whole lot of time on all these because, again, uh, I've given you references to, to look at for some of these things. But this will help you understand why R.C. Sproul says some of the things he said that sometimes leave people confused. And this is why um, uh, Michael Kruger and I, two years ago, yeah, two years ago, uh, coming up week after next uh, at the G3 conference, did what we did on the subject of the canon. And again, I would highly recommend that to you, um, that discussion that we had and the Michael Kruger's books, because the idea of infallible men as the source of the canon is one of the key errors of both Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, and Roman Catholic argumentation. You need to know what the canon is. And again, I, I don't know how many times I've given the presentation on Canon 1, Canon 2, what these things are, what the, the theological nature. They're not my favorite presentations. Favorite for other people. Because they don't recognize the importance of understanding that the Canon is a theological construct before it's a historical construct. Uh, Rome and Eastern Orthodoxy will use it as a historical issue. Um... And hence what this father said and what that father said and this person, that person, so on and so forth, rather than recognizing that canon is directly related to inspiration and to the actions of God, and therefore it's God that determines canon, and the church is the passive recipient, not of a divine revelation of the canon, but of the canon itself. So the, the list of the canon is what's, what I've called an artifact of revelation, God-inspired at least one book, but he didn't inspire all books. Therefore, the canon comes into existence of necessity by the limit, by the action of inspiration and the limitation of that action of inspiration. Um, 
add that one to your list. There's two sections, a bunch of, bunch of stuff that's super relevant in Scripture alone to this subject. Um, very, very important that you get some of those foundational issues down. It's ultimately nonsense. It's ultimately contradictory. It doesn't work. So what we have here is the assumption of tradition. And tradition comes to us in two forms. There's an oral form and there's a written form. The written form being, of course, the scriptures themselves and the liturgies. And this is something I didn't understand as a Protestant. I didn't understand the importance of the liturgy that even went into the decision as to what books would be included in the canon of Scripture, which again... Okay, now th th this is where you have the orthodox spin on this particular... Because the argument is very, very similar to that which Rome would use. Um, but this is the orthodox spin, is because in orthodoxy... See, orthodoxy... I, I didn't say this earlier, but let me say it now. From my perspective, orthodoxy is encrusted in the tradition of time and is essentially stuck at the end of the 8th century. And many of the problems that it faces, and it faces many problems, and once people get into it, they realize just how fractured and divided it is, and uh, it, it, you know, it, it's presented one way, especially to the West. You go to the East, and it's, it's lived out in a very different way. Um, but the divisions that exist there I don't think can be healed because the fact that orthodoxy is stuck in history. It is stuck in the liturgy and tradition of the ninth century, seventh and ninth century. And it can't go beyond that. It can't get beyond that. And that tradition eventually overrides the life-giving power of Scripture as the living voice of Christ in the church and overshadow scripture. It becomes not just a lens, but it's like when a person gets a cataract. When you get a cataract, the lens becomes foggy. It, it becomes, it's no longer perfectly transparent. And so that's how the liturgy and tradition in orthodoxy functions in looking at scripture. And the, the voice of scripture becomes muted. That's, that's why Rome, in its infallibility, enters into a monologue. There's no longer, there's no longer, it's just the voice of the church, sola ecclesia. And in orthodoxy, you end up with sola traditio. That tradition and that liturgy becomes so fixed that it fossilizes. And like the lens, it becomes thick and no longer transparent. And you can't see what the scriptures are actually saying. There can be no correction. They're semper reformanda, means always reforming because the reformers recognized the true nature of man. And this is one of the primary heretical errors of orthodoxy, is it has a fundamentally unbiblical anthropology, a fundamentally unbiblical anthropology, doctrine of man. And because it does, it cannot be corrected because the lens through which it looks at Scripture filters that out. That's why sola scriptura is so important. Because sola scriptura allows the church to continuously hear the voice of Christ in Scripture for each and every generation without that becoming um, muted. Okay, now we're using hearing rather than seeing, but you see, the, you see the relationship. Without it becoming muted through tradition, without that lens becoming so thick that it filters out the things that would correct the errors that the church is now embracing. And when it comes to soteriology the doctrine of man, and again, we're speaking as Westerners, the doctrine of man is communicated and understood through the liturgy and traditions of the 7th through 9th centuries in the East for the modern-day faithful Eastern Orthodox person. And so there can't be a correction because you've denied Sola Scriptura. There it is again. Um, very important aspect to, to keep in mind. It took many, many centuries. So Sola Scriptura is not only an unworkable and, and, and non-biblical and, and ahistorical... Now notice, Mr. Dyer has not even given us a definition of Sola Scriptura. He has conflated things. 
Um, this is not a careful discussion by any means. He's going off the top of his head. So am I. I don't have anything in front of me right now. I mean, I'm pulling books off the shelf, but I'm not reading. I'm just showing them to you. Um, but still, there is a, um, a lack of clearness here. He has yet to deal, and maybe, maybe he didn't know. He's inexcusable for not knowing, but maybe he didn't know, or very often my experience is apostates um, end up twisting their memories a good bit. Maybe he didn't know that Sola Scriptura is fundamentally focused upon the nature of Scripture as Theanustas. Remember, that's why I asked Mitch Pacwa in our debate in San Diego, 1999, on Sola Scriptura. Has Roman Catholicism defined a single word that Jesus ever said that is not contained in Holy Scripture? Well, of course not. Has it defined anything that any apostle ever said that's not in Holy Scripture. Well, of course not. Then this idea of living tradition, the, the, the oral tradition over against the written tradition, um, this becomes extremely problematic because you can't trace it to the apostles themselves. And the traditions claimed by orthodoxy are different than the traditions claimed by Rome. Um, this is why we have gone back into the early church before and talked about the very first reference to apostolic tradition in Irenaeus is the idea that Jesus was more than 50 years old when he died. First time it's claimed. Irenaeus claims, I got this from the, from the disciples of Jesus. I got this from the apostles. Nobody believes it today, but that's what he claimed. So how can something that then comes hundreds of years later actually go back to the apostles? The only thing that we know that is theanustos, that is God-breathed, is what is in Scripture. Now, they would claim, well, you don't know that Scripture without us. Well, that's a different issue, and the very fact that they don't have, I mean, he just said, well, it was seven, eight hundred years before the canon is complete. I, I think that's a, a, a massive exaggeration, but if, if what you mean by decided means every single person agreeing on every single element, it'll never be decided, because there's still people who disagree today. So that doesn't mean anything. Um, so, you, you can see these are issues that must be thought through. And the Reformers had thought them through. Now, Luther had to think them through <laughs> after the Reformation started. <laughs> that's what Leipzig was all about. That's what disputation there. That's what, um, you know, very, very important along those lines. Um, but especially by the second generation, these things were being thought through very, very, very carefully. Um I don't know what the church history class was at Bonson Theological Seminary, but I would sort of be surprised if there wasn't a fair amount of emphasis upon these, these very issues. You know, I don't, I don't know. It's actually easy to refute just from Scripture itself by the fact that there was no New Testament canon. So when you see the New Testament refer to the text, oftentimes it's citing the Septuagint. The Okay, now... A person who makes that argument has no clue what, what Sola Scriptura is. And I just have to ask, why Why would... So, th there's no excuse for this, okay? This is just a bad argument. And to say it's easily refuted, and then you give a bad argument, leaves those of us who understand what we're talking about going, why should we give you much uh, credibility here? I mean, you're... Your bona fides as a former one of us are now gone because you're misrepresenting the position you allegedly once espoused. There is nothing about the New Testament quoting from the Greek Septuagint and the fact that the New Testament was still being written at the time that is even relevant to Sola Scriptura. Why do you think that it is? How, how, how is that an argument that there is something outside the canon of Scripture that's theonistos? There, there's no connection there. And there's obviously, during periods of inscripturation, you can't practice sola scriptura when further revelation is being given, but we agree that revelation ended. So the question is, what is the normative state of the church, not is what is the non-normative state of the church during the period of time of revelation? They, they, they don't want to deal with issues like that. And maybe someone who claims to have once been one of us, like, Jay Dyer does, 
maybe he never thought about these things. I don't know. All I know is right now that that statement, this is easy to refute, tells me Jay Dyer has either forgotten or not done serious thought on this particular subject. Um, but the problem is, if you're talking to people who themselves have not done serious thought on this, then it sounds like Wow, I've, well, I've, I've never thought about that. And see, they're getting to establish the categories. So, for example, he's already just asserted that you have the written tradition and the oral tradition. Has he demonstrated the continued existence of an oral tradition? Because I know where they're going to go. I know where they're going to go to do that. But has he demonstrated that? What do you do with the fact that the writings of the early church for the first 500 years will give us all sorts of different and contradictory interpretations as to what that is. I mean, there's, there's a lot to be thought of here. And so I don't want those of you who may be feeling I've been mean to you by saying you need to be doing some homework. Um, and I'm talking about reformed people. Um, I'm not being mean to you. Um, but I am wanting you to make sure that to understand Calvin didn't ignore this stuff. Luther eventually did not ignore this stuff. He had to get around to it. Um, Zwingli didn't have a lot of time to deal with these things, but he did address some of these issues. And certainly the next generation did as well. We don't have to make everything they said inspired because it wasn't. Um, but it is very, very useful to, to look back at what they had to say, and we can learn much from that. We don't have to agree with everything. We can see that there are times they overreached, uh, just as there were times when the early church fathers did. Allow the people of the past to be the people of the past. Judge them within the context in which they lived. Very, very important aspect of things. Um, run out of time here, but uh, we'll try to get a little bit more in here. Greek translation of the Old Testament, right? And it never says that the Greek <laughs> Septuagint translation of the Old Testament is all that's necessary, right? When Paul says that the scripture is sufficient to make the man of God ready for every work to Timothy, does that mean that there's not going to be, or there's no need for a F New Testament canon? Now, okay, let me, we'll stop there. I'll, I'll make a, I'll make a mark because uh, there's more, more that I want to get to. Did you catch that? Because this is, I don't, I don't have it in here, I don't think. Um, but I remember when I first encountered this argument. And it would have been 1988? Maybe even earlier than that, but right around then. And it was in a book I, that I have in the other room called Catholicism and Fundamentalism by Carl Keating. So this is most of the argumentation of Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism against Sola Scriptura will be the same. Their, their, their proposed solutions won't necessarily be the same, but the argument will be the same. What about 2 Timothy 3? Because Timothy had probably never seen Mark or Luke and John probably wasn't even written by then. Um, he, he didn't have the new Testament. And so doesn't second Timothy three prove too much. Now, if you have taken the time to listen to the debate with Patrick Madrid or Jerry Matitix or any of these other folks, you already know the answer to these things, or at least I hope you do. If you've read scripture alone, I hope you, if you've read Rome, the Roman Catholic controversy, I've addressed it in all of those works of necessity. But you need to hear what the objection is. Because in my experience, when you really feel the weight of an objection and then you discover what the answer to it is, you'll remember it. If you're just like a little bird in the nest with the mouth open, feed me what my response is supposed to be, that in my experience, doesn't result in long-lasting ability to then communicate that to the next generation, the next generation, the next generation after that. So, what is, what are we to say 
in regards to 2 Timothy 3, that Paul says to Timothy, go to the scriptures, and they're able to equip you as a man of God for every good work. I almost hear in the back of what J. Dyer is saying there, a recognition he's heard, and us address this before, maybe myself included. So, how do you answer that question? I've given you enough time now to, to give it some consideration. You just might want to stop the recording and, and jot down how would you respond to that? Because there are assumptions being made in the argument, and this is this is where believers today must ask for God's wisdom and ability to hear the hidden assumptions of arguments. When, when people talk to me about, you've done all these debates, and you, 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 I understand what you're saying when you respond, but how did you, how did you, how did you come up with that? How do you do that? It is, when I hear an argument, it's almost like it's a visual thing. I can see the hidden assumptions, the presuppositions behind the question. And it's just simply an ability that we all must practice. It's critical thought. It really is vitally important. So when you hear that, what is the assumption that you need to identify? Well, first of all, it is not Paul's intention to be addressing the canon of Scripture in writing to Timothy. He's writing to Timothy during a period of inscripturation. Did, was Titus written after this? Did, did, did Paul even recognize which of his books? Because we know he wrote other letters. Did, did he himself know which would be in the canon of Scripture if he even was thinking about a canon of Scripture? There's no way he can be communicating with Peter or with Jude uh, or with John, uh, or with Matthew, or Mark, or Luke. Well, he, Luke, he could. Um, so he doesn't. He doesn't know what the you know the apostles you know didn't didn't go uh, say, hey John, where are you? And uh, okay, all right, all right I'm I'm just working on Colossians here. All right, all right, then, you know that, that that wasn't a possibility. Couldn't couldn't be done. So he's not talking about the canon of scripture. So if you use Second Timothy three. To establish canon scripture, you will be in error. And what they're doing is they're making you defend that by the way they make the statement. That's what Carl Keating did. And I just saw so many Christians getting pushed into defending something. That, that's what happened when, I, when, I, when, when Jerry and I debated the papacy in Denver. And Keating and, and Madrid debated two fundamentalist Baptists the same night. We've talked about this many times in the past. I know, again, it's probably been 15 years ago. Um, but this took place in 1993, Denver, right? Okay. They destroyed those Baptists, just destroyed them. And the reason they destroyed them is they, they knew what they believed better than the Baptists knew what they believed. And they knew they were fundamentalists, and they knew that they could use the fundamentalist mindset to force fundamentalists to defend statements they should never defend. And so that's what's going on here, is we're not making the argument the 2 Timothy 3 establishes a canon. We are not making an argument that um, the canon is being completed by this statement. Nothing like that. What we are saying is that when Paul says to Timothy, difficult times are coming, false teachers are coming, you, Timothy, you remain firm on what you've become convinced of because you know from whom you've, le you've learned it, and you know the scriptures which are able to give you wisdom leading to salvation in Jesus Christ. It's the same thing he said to the elders in Acts chapter 20. After he says, there are going to be people who rise up from your own ranks, dragging disciples away after themselves, I commit you to God and the word of his grace. He says to Timothy, Timothy, if you want to be prepared for every good work, go to that which is what? Theanustos, God breathed. Theanustos, God breathed. The church does not make the scriptures. Theanustos, 
God does. Timothy, go to that which is the graphe, the Hagia graphe, the Holy Scriptures, which may be still to come. That doesn't change anything. Timothy, if you want to be exartizo, if you want to be fully equipped, then you need to go to that which is theanustas. And you already know that what you have in the Tanakh is theanustas. And he, has, he knows that what he has from Paul, likewise, is authoritative in that same sense, even if he's not thinking of issues of canon. The point is, it has to be what God has given to the church. And that's why I asked Patrick Madrid in our debate, show me how the scriptures equip you to teach unique Roman Catholic dogmas, such as the infallibility of the Pope, or the bodily assumption of Mary. And you can't, because A, they're untrue, B, they're not good works, and C, they're not in Scripture. So, 2 Timothy 3 is vitally important, because it says that which equips the man of God is that which is theanustos. And so you have to put the shoe on the other foot, so to speak, and say to the Eastern Orthodox person, say to the Roman Catholic, you show me what is theanustos outside of Scripture and prove your case. They can't do it. You're simply saying, I stand on what is theanustos. And I can go to Jesus, who condemned the Jews of his day, for elevating what they thought was divine tradition to the status of being theonistos, God breathed, and then used that as a mechanism of rebellion. So, uh, what do I highly recommend for reading for you? Well, um, I've contributed to the subject. There's two right there. Roman Catholic controversy is going to have some more there. There is very important good stuff in Calvin's Institutes, absolutely no question about that whatsoever. Remember, Calvin himself said that if you want to know what his beliefs are, you start with the Institutes as the lens. There are a lot of people who go to the commentaries. Calvin is assuming, he doesn't, he is not taking the time in his commentaries to give you theological terminology. Those are his sermons. Those are him speaking extemporaneously. He's laid it out. The lens, for me, the Institutes. That's, if you want to know where I'm coming from, read the Institutes first. Then, um, Webster and King, very, very, very important. Kruger's works on the canon of Scripture. There are, are multiple copies, some for laymen, some of his more uh, in-depth stuff you want, might want to be looking at. Um, the book that he edited on the second century church would be vitally important, vitally important. I don't have the title of it and I don't have it in here. Right. Oh, do I, do, do I not? I don't think I do. Nope. Don't have it here right now. Um, cause this isn't my office by the way. Uh, so Kruger's work on the second century church, very, very important. Uh, heresy of orthodoxy. Um, we'll have a lot of stuff that'll touch upon these issues. Then William Whitaker's disputations and Holy scripture. George Salmon's Infallibility Church. Um, there's, the other one is escaping my mind. Right, obviously Martin Chemnitz's work on Chemnitz isn't. Sometimes Chemnitz is historically a little bit off on some of the sources he uses, but still a, a good resource to have. Um, and then the two volume starts the C. I thought um, Brother King is out there screaming at me right now, trying to tell me what it is. But um, I'll if we could when we continue, I'll I'll. Um, I'll bring that up as well. These will be vitally important uh, resources uh, for you if you want to get started and have a, um, a solid foundation for responding to these things uh, because it, it is important. And um, yeah, okay. I was, I was going to say, you, uh, yeah, just, uh, just almost sound like a helicopter heading straight for us. It's the, it's the Vatican helicopter coming at us. Um, these will also help you in dealing with so many other issues uh, as well, as well. So I think that's Rich saying, you've gone long enough. I've got to edit all this stuff anyway, so stop talking. So I don't know 
what the next program is going to look like or when it's going to be able to take place. Uh, I am out of town Tuesday and Wednesday uh, of, of next week. So I understand that some equipment's coming in on Monday. We may have to do it the same way on, on Monday if we do a program on Monday. I don't know. We'll see. We'll get it fixed. We'll get back to the regular schedule. That's his job, so don't interrupt him. Um, call him up and tell him you're praying for him, that he'll, he'll, he'll have wisdom and how to put it all back together again. But thanks for listening to the program today. We'll see you next time. God bless.